Hello to everybody. My name is Mira Keys. I'm clinical professor in radiation oncology at University of British Columbia. And today I will be introducing the series uh, Brachytherapy for Prostate Cancer. This is sponsored by American Brachytherapy Society, and I'm editor for these uh, G rounds. And what is brachytherapy? Brachytherapy is radiotherapy by encapsulated radionuclides. They're embedded into the tumor tissue. So we'll, this is really an introductory session. So I have no disclosures. And uh, so, as I said, this, this is going to be an introductory session, a lecture series about prostate brachytherapy. And really our goal here is to inform the conversation about multidisciplinary management of prostate cancer. So just a brief introduction about American Brachytherapy Society. This is a society founded in 1978 to provide insight, rationale, and research into the use of brachytherapy in the treatment of both malignant and benign condition. And the organization consists mostly of physicians and physicists. However, others also interested in brachytherapy like nurses, radiation therapists, as well as the surgeons. So we'll have the uh, three series that um, will be uh, referring to brachytherapy for prostate cancer. In series one, we will talk about outcomes with brachytherapy and we'll refer to myths about brachytherapy, long-term outcome for low, intermediate and high-risk disease. We'll look at comparative outcomes with other treatment modalities and particularly radiation. We'll look at the definition of PSA failure or the cure definition with brachytherapy. We will separately address low dose rate and high dose rate brachytherapy, socioeconomic aspects, as well as training in brachytherapy. Series two, we'll talk about toxicity, long-term toxicity, GU, GI, sexual function, most feared complications, fistulas, toxicity comparative outcomes with other radiation modalities, how to reduce toxicity, and we'll also touch on new uh, te technological advancements. The third series will be about uh, technical aspects of brachytherapy as well as imaging. We'll talk about role of MRI, PET scan in brachytherapy, ultrasound versus CT or MRI-based HDR. Physics lecture will be there for you as well. We'll talk about salvage brachytherapy, focal brachytherapy, and finally, something very obscure but very important, penile brachytherapy as well. So what is brachytherapy? Brachy really means short in Greek. So this is a treatment from the short distance to radioactive material. Really, it implies placement of the radioactive material adjacent to or directly into the tumor. And so the diseases that we treat with brachytherapy are really vast, include cervix, endometrial cancer, esophagus, lung, skin cancer, penile cancer, sarcomas, ocular melanoma, breast, and of course, prostate cancer. This is a surgical specialty of radiation oncology, and it does require additional training. It takes about a year to master prostate brachytherapy. And really, when it comes to radiation oncologists, as this is a basically non-surgical specialty, not everyone is really inter interested uh, to learn how to do it. And just for your information, the first brachytherapists were actually urologists, and we'll touch on that a little bit later as well. Brachytherapy is really the most conformal form of radiation and gives the highest dose of radiation, and it's extremely effective. So I'll give you a little history. And the history starts at Paris in the beginning of 1900s. So this is a world exhibition. And so in 1901, the brachytherapies was essentially invented by Pierre Curie when he gave a small radium tube to Dr. Donalds and suggested that he actually inserted it into the tumor. And in 1909 in Paris, there was the first radium capsule that was inserted in prostatic urethra through a catheter. In 1915, Memorial Sloan Kettering was an already inserted radium needles into the prostate cancer. So as you can see, the surgeons really were the first brachytherapist. In 1967, there was the first iodine seed implant done, and this was really done as a salvage treatment. Patient actually soon after the treatment died from heart attack, and there was really no evidence of tumor or the autopsy. And so Dr. Whitemore at the time commented that outcomes was determined by biology rather than the mode of therapy. So in 1983 begins really the modern era of prostate brachytherapy. 
And in 1980s, really with development of the uh, transrectal ultrasound and planning to guide the placement of radioactive sources within the prostate, Dr. Holmes, who was also a surgeon, invented essentially the prostate brachytherapy as we know it today with the radioactive iodine seeds that were loaded into the needles and then inserted into the prostate through the perineum. And in 1980s, late 1980s, the Seattle group really perfect, perfected this technique. And what you see here on the, on the pictures is really how it's done. And uh, on this uh, finger is a little tiny grain of um, like a, the size of a grain of rice, a little tiny radioactive seed. And the bottom right corner is really what, uh, what the pelvis or the prostate looks like after the implant has been completed. So I'm just going to give you some radiation oncology 101, just to understand really the place of brachytherapy in the whole scheme of treatment of cancer. So sometimes uh, people think that there is actually radio resistant tumors. Some people don't really respond well to radiation, but that is actually not correct. There's really no radio resistant tumors at all. There's also just a failure to cure any cancer or localized prostate cancer. And this is really due to inadequate dose, which so we just don't give an ad adequate dose to kill the tumor, or we actually miss the tumor. But all the tumors are actually radiosensitive. You just have to give appropriate dose, and you have to target it well, right? So when we look at the surgery, surgery is really very good to eliminate the bulk of the disease, but the failure of the surgery comes from microscopic disease that is left behind, if it's left behind. External beam radiation is really excellent for eliminating microscopic disease, but the failure really comes from the bulk of the disease. And then brachytherapy gives a very high dose to the tumor, and it's very good to eliminate the tumor bulk. And if we combine external beam radiation and brachytherapy, what we get is really the, the best of the both worlds. We eliminate microscopic disease, and we also eliminate the bulk. So I'm just going to show you what happened really with uh, huge enthusiasm that came into radiation oncology field with invention of IMRT and, and lately SPRT. So these are new techniques that conformally deliver very high dose of radiation to a particular tissue. And so in 2003, there was a very big shift in how radiation is delivered and IMRT was introduced. And there was a great enthusiasm to try to avoid doing brachytherapy in cervical cancer because brachytherapy is quite technically complex and complicated. Not everybody's really trained well to do it. So people start to omit brachytherapy and utilization really dropped down significantly, as you can see in this graph. And this is really what happened with overall survival. So the top red line is uh, patients with advanced cervical cancer who got brachytherapy and below our dose who did not get brachytherapy, just to show that the last principle that we discuss, which is when you give brachytherapy at external beam and add external beam radiation, just like we do in, in cervical cancer, you actually deal effectively with the bulk of the disease as well as microscopic disease. A little bit more about radiation oncology one-on-one. -on -one. There are three parameters when we want to consider if uh, we are to cure the cancer with radiation. The first one is radiation dose. And as we said, as I said, you must give the adequate radiation dose. The second is you must not miss the tumor. So you must totally be aware where the tumor is. You must cover the entire tumor volume, including microscopic disease. And there's some limitations of imaging really when we talk about tumor location. And there's also normal tissue tolerance. And the question is, can the normal tissue uh, uh, tolerate this curative radiation dose and recover the function. And really this is all about complication rate. So if you look at radiation dose, um, I always like to say to my residents, you can kill any tumor if you give enough radiation. That's absolutely correct. And this is where dose escalation concept comes from. And this is how this IMRT and proton treatment and more, more recently um, SABRE or SPRT were kind of invented to really try to give higher radiation dose to the, to, the, to the tumor tissue and spare the normal tissue as much as possible. But brachytherapy really gives the highest dose. And then there is a concept of tumor location. So what is the geographical tumor distribution? Do we treat prostate only? What stage of cancer that is? Is there extra capsular extension? What margins should we give around the, 
the, our planning. Uh, do we treat seminal vesicles? Is imaging helpful? How about lymph nodes? You know, do we have a PSMA PET scan, MR, CT? Do we use Spartan tables to determine if somebody needs uh, lymph node treatment or Roche formula? Or does somebody have alcohol metastatic disease? And again, imaging is very, very important. So we really have to uh, be as accurate as possible in determining the tumor stage and tumor um, geographical distribution of the tumor. And the third one is concept of normal tissue tolerance and what dose can we actually give and the normal tissue will still be to repair the dam be able to repair the damage. What is the safe of radiation dose? Can we deliver it? And really all depends on normal tissue tolerance, geometry of the tumors as well as the location. And so on this graph, what you see on the X axis is dose and on the Y axis is tumor cell kill. And so we see really the graph of dose versus normal tissue damage. So in green uh, line is a normal tissue and brown red line is a tumor tissue. So really this um, graph uh, shows that as the radiation dose increases, the normal tissue damage increases faster than the tumor cell kill. And then in particular dose, you're not getting any more tumor cell kill, but you're actually getting far greater uh, normal tissue damage. So this is actually really good to keep in mind when we, when we design our protocols. And uh, again, there is no radio resistant tumors. I think you know we have repeated that enough uh, by now. Brachytherapy gives the highest dose just to conclude that. And we can really get away with this because there's a very uh, steep uh, uh, dose fall off and the normal tissue is spared more so than it is actually spared with external beam radiation. And all external beam radiation and SBRT is really trying to do is to mimic brachytherapy. So these are some dose distributions from the prostate seed implant on the top left corner, you see seeds distributed throughout the prostate, yellow is urethra, and then at the back, uh, the blue one is rectum. And so this uh, dose, uh, brachytherapy dose of 100%, this is a prescription dose, you see the uh, green cloud around the prostate, and this is 50% of the dose to your right on the top corner. So you see that there is a very, very steep dose fall off. And at the bottom, you have the CT scan of the prostate uh, and patient who had prostate brachytherapy in green line is a 50% of the dose. And here is a 50% of the dose in the middle uh, produced by external beam radiation. So you see much more dose delivered actually to the normal tissue. There's two ways of delivering prostate brachytherapy. One is with temporary implants, high dose rate brachytherapy, and the other one is permanent seed implant or permanent implants with low dose rate brachytherapy. And both of these could be used as monotherapy combination with external beam radiation plus brachytherapy boost or as a salvage. And so I'll just very briefly outline the process of low dose rate brachytherapy. Patients are seen in consultation, and then they go ahead and have an ultrasound volume study. And here's the ultrasound volume study where we outline the prostate, and then the, which is in red. And then in the, um, in the light blue color is the something that we call the PTV or planning target volume, which is really the volume that we actually want to treat. So you can appreciate that we treat the prostate with the margins around. And then we proceed to the planning process where physicists or radiation oncologist and jo usually jointly together outline the distribution of the seeds throughout the prostate. This is done th three-dimensionally using computers, very seed or other programs. And then seeds are ordered and three weeks later they come shipped and then we go to the OR. So there's a patient being prepared for the brachytherapy procedure. This is how usually seeds uh, arrive. They're, um, this white thing is really the lead shielding and each seed uh, has a number and uh, they are pre-specified as to how to be loaded based on the plan. So here's one needle. So very few instruments that we actually have in the OR. So again, a little bit of OR, there's a template in front of the perineum. Every needle has a three-dimensional position within the prostate in X, Y, and Z coordinates. So these are, now we are measuring actually the um, distance from the needle to the template, which is um, outlining by the uh, Z coordinate or the depth. Here is uh, some more closer picture and picture of the ultrasound and some seeds in the prostate, these little white specks uh, that you see. And this is how the perineum looks after the procedure. So that's all the damage that we cause to the outside. Um, so patients can resume their activities essentially the same day. 
After the procedure, CT scan of the pelvis and prostate is done to really look at the final position of the seeds. And this is very important for the quality assurance. So here's a CT scan with the seeds and then we calculate the dose. And this is a final, uh, final quality assurance procedure and as it serves as documentation. And then again, here is the 2D image of the prostate and uh, seeds inside the prostate. This takes about three hours. It's an outpatient procedure. Patient goes home the same day. The HDR or high dose rate brachytherapy is a slightly different process, but uh, there's uh, lots of similarities. It can be done using ultrasound-based technique, CT-based technique, or MR-based technique. Doses are quite uh, different for monotherapy boost or salvage, and they're listed below. These slides are actually courtesy of my colleague who does a lot of HDR, Dr. Peter Rossi. And so this is his uh, work uh, worksheet as well. The whole procedure takes about four to six hours, a little bit longer than um, the seed procedure. About 60 minutes goes to the OR and then 30 minutes for imaging and then 30 minutes for treatment itself. And the whole procedure is outpatient again. It's completed in four to six hours. And here are the instruments that uh, they have at the table. Again, here is the OR setting with all the monitors and plans, and uh, you see the template that goes in front of the perineum here. And then the next step is needle insertion, and I'm just going to play a little video if I can here. So this is now the um, transfer image of the prostate, and you can see all the needles that are actually inserted into the prostate in their final position. And uh, the next step is really planning the radiation when all, this, all the needles are placed into the position, then uh, the planning is done by physicist and radiation oncologist. And so to the left-hand side here, you can see the uh, uh, yellow line, which is a prostate and base of the seminal vesicles. The green is urethra, and these are the various doses around uh, the prostate tissue. Here you see the needles at the top of the top of the needles in the seminal vesicles and then the dose around the seminal vesicles. This is a Foley balloon. And on this side, you can actually see that um, dominant intraprostatic lesion is outlined from the MRI. And so here's a uh, uh, big uh, yellow um, outline. Here's the prostate and in green is again PTV. And we can really easily with HDR paint that dose and actually give more to the area of gross disease than to the rest of the prostate. Just a quick word about utilization of brachytherapy. So utilization of brachytherapy has decreased quite significantly. And so you see here two graphs and on this graph, basically the, um, this is brachytherapy graph and radical prostatectomy has gone significantly up and radiation, this is external beam has gone down as well. So I think this is all due to robotic prostatectomy that has become very popular. And then there's another graph from 2019 published in Nature when again, brachytherapy utilization is going down. So why is that? There's many different reasons, but uh, some are listed here. First of all, we started PSA screening and there's significant changes in, um, <clears throat> in new recommendations. And as you know, we screen less uh, men and so there's uh, really less incidence of prostate cancer that, we, that had been noted in the last, uh, I would say five to 10 years. The um, change in low risk um, patient treatments management to recommendation with active surveillance and also contributed to decrease in utilization brachytherapy. Brachytherapy is actually quite complex technically. It's costly to start and maintain the brachytherapy program. There's significant logistic challenges. There's also inadequate brachytherapy training these days. These new technologies that are really becoming quite popular and widely used and include robotic surgery, IMRT, SBRT, protons. And there's also significant issues with the reimbursement because reimbursement is really much higher for robotic surgery and IMRT. And I'm just gonna show you briefly here that in the US, the healthcare spending is steadily increases as you may imagine. And in 2017, it was actually 18% of GDP. And in 2010, 124 billion goes to cancer care and 12 billion goes to prostate cancer. So 10% of your entire spending uh, of the cancer care goes to prostate cancer. And so here is in thousands of dollars, how much it costs active surveillance, low dose rate brachytherapy, 
HDR and significantly more goes to robotic surgery or IMRT per patient. And if I just show you now really what is the uh, profit to, to the hospitals from having patient, having LDR, brachytherapy, or IMRT, you can see the significant difference in favor of IMRT. So that has significant, we think it's it actually contributed to, um, to significantly decrease in utilization in the US at least. But brachytherapy utilization is actually increasing in Canada. And so why is that? So we have done a, a significant effort to educate uh, all the radiation oncologists, urologists, GPs. We are making significant efforts to educate the public. There's an effort to, to bring this into the residence education. We now have AFC accreditation program, which is really the formalized fellowship for brachytherapy and uh, accredited by Royal College of uh, Physicians and Surgeons in Canada. So it's a specific um, uh, fellowship accredited program and reimbursement is completely different. So why increase utilization of brachytherapy in the US? Because it is a very effective treatment for localized prostate cancer, for all prostate cancer, including low, intermediate and high risk as well. It is actually most effective. And with the new reimbursement that uh, you may um, start um, uh, having more broadly in the US, really new reimbursement is actually favoring brachytherapy. And lastly, what are the benefits of um, brachytherapy? It's an outpatient procedure and patients go home in about two to three hours. The catheter is removed the same day. There's a very quick recovery time or no recovery time. Uh, cure rates are excellent. Uh, the toxicity is very reasonable. Mostly it consists of um, a GU irritative and obstructive symptoms. There's minimal or no incontinence and there's excellent sexual function following the treatment. And as I just mentioned, uh, this is a very cost-effective treatment. And because it's cost-effective and also effective in, in, in treating the prostate cancer, it prevents downstream events. It prevents significant lifelong treatment toxicity for failures and prevent downstream financial burden to society as well as to the individuals. So with that, I would like to welcome you to GUR series of brachytherapy for prostate cancer sponsored by American Brachytherapy Society. Thank you.